Good afternoon. We're here today to inspire each other to reinvent our community. And I invite you to explore with me how the transformation we seek will come about through our intentional language. As you said, I'm interested in the power of speech. And I believe, as suggested by community builder and philosopher Peter Block, that the community we reinvent together will emerge from our conversations, and that each word in these conversations matter. Transformation is linguistic. How does this work? Well, I invite you to think of an example from your own life. Take a moment, take a deep breath, and think about an experience you've had recently, a conversation or a conflict that was about change, a change you wanted to make in your home, workplace, or community. Just call that to mind. And now I invite you to reflect silently on that conversation, noticing your speech choices and your experience. Who spoke? Was there equal space for everyone involved to speak and listen? Where was your speech located? Was it interpreting the past, exploring the present, or envisioning the future? What was the overall feeling or tone of your conversation? Was it one of hope and possibility or skepticism? Was there gratitude and appreciation or criticism and judgment? What was the reality that you created with your words? Is it one in which you want to live? I ask these questions not for you to judge, defend, or praise your speech choices, but rather to bring awareness how even our seemingly informal conversations create our experience. Our words have power. And the more awareness we bring to them, the greater change we can make in our world. I want to share an experience that I've had is a mundane one, but it's one that uh, I think can be generalized and would work in larger situations as well. I've shared an office space for the past few years. It was chronically hot and stuffy, and it had been that way for a long time. Formal complaints had been submitted, but nothing had been done. So this fall, a few of us got together and brainstormed some possibilities. We focused on what we wanted, which was increased airflow. We approached the appropriate administrator with our solutions, and within a month, there had been change made. The vent had been uncovered and improved, and the office is now noticeably more comfortable to be in. There had been attempts at making change for years. So what was different this time? Well, we had shifted our focus from what the problem was to what the solution was, what we wanted to create. How we speak matters, and what we say matters. Wherever our focus is, that's what our experience will be. I came to some of these understandings through significant personal struggle. Uh, through a dark time in my life, I was trying to create external change, and I was trying to create personal change as well, and not quite sure how to go about it. My friends would tell me, be careful what you wish for, and just make a list, focus on what you want in your life. But I brushed those words aside. I thought that my external reality had to do with what was happening to me and was beyond my control. I began to notice, though, as I watched my speech and my experience, how closely aligned they were, and also that much of my pain was self-created, and that in each moment the possibility of choice existed. So I spent time at Yashoda Ashram in BC studying yoga to better understand how my speech created my reality, and I'm so grateful for my teachers there and the wisdom they shared, the practices, and uh, the space that they held for me to do that exploration. Many of the ancient wisdom teachings say this, that inner transformation precedes external change. And it's not just yoga. It's all over the place. These are the wisdom, the truth that's been passed down to us. I'm going to move to my notes now for the rest of the talk. <laughs> Thank you for your patience there. They say that true change comes about as we practice self-awareness, and clarity and integrity with our speech. And it's not just our audible words, the words that we speak out loud, but also our inaudible words, our thoughts, the ones in our mind. Our thoughts precede our speech. So our thoughts have power too. Where are your thoughts right now? Are you aware of your internal dialogue? Perhaps you've been listening to what I'm saying, but maybe there's something else going on in there as well. Perhaps compiling a grocery list for tomorrow, or maybe a conversation with a friend that you're remembering. But no matter what you're thinking or are thinking, can you change your thoughts at any moment? Can you rephrase, reframe, or reinterpret your thoughts? Of course. What do you want to welcome into the house of your mind? And what will you invite to stay longer?
while our thoughts tend to flow continuously and pop up uninvited, the more attention we bring to what is there, the more awareness we have, the more choice we have about which thoughts we choose to focus on, which thoughts we choose to develop, and which thoughts we choose to speak out loud. We can be intentional and disciplined with which words we voice. And there's many traditions and cultures that have sayings about disciplined speech. For example, we have the very simplistic, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And I think there's some problems with this. I mean, it's, it's very simple, but also it sometimes justifies staying silent and pressing down anger, frustration, or concern. I think this is misguided. Being nice doesn't mean that we stay silent when we see or experience injustice or oppression. We have a responsibility, an ability to respond, and to do so in a way that is both honest with ourselves and respectful of the other. How we speak matters just as much as what we say. The way that we structure our phrases and our sentences, our questions, it has the potential to open spaces for dialogue between us or to build up walls of resistance, judgment, and defense. Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of the tribe or movement of nonviolent communication, encouraged us, us to take responsibility for our behaviors, thoughts, feelings, and needs by using clear, direct, and honest language when we're expressing ourselves and making requests of others. For example, using the structure of nonviolent communication, rather than saying, You make me so mad. You never do your dishes. You're so irresponsible. I could instead take responsibility for my own feelings and needs by saying, when I see the dishes you made left on the counter for the third day in a row, I feel tired because I've had a long day and I'd like to rest now. I feel frustrated because I need to have a tidy space in order to be able to rest well. Now there's one more thing I need to do and I feel a little sad and lonely. I need support in caring for our shared spaces. Would you be willing to do the dishes now or perhaps would you be willing to join me in doing the dishes now? And while it might seem like a trivial example, just doing dishes, remember that it's each conversation, each interaction that we have that's creating our experience together. The more respect we have for ourselves and others and the way that comes out in our speech, the more respect we'll all experience. Our language has the power to transform, and it begins with me, with you, with each one of us being honest with ourselves and taking full responsibility for our words. Peter Bloch suggests that if transformation is linguistic, then community building requires that we engage in a new conversation, one that we have not had before, one that can create an experience of aliveness and belonging. We need to focus on what we want to create and what is working well that we'd like to enhance rather than the problems. And this requires that every time we gather, each and every time, becomes a model for the future we'd like to create together. Every conversation, every word counts. I'd like to leave you with an exercise that's been helpful for me in developing speech awareness. Try it for an hour or a day or maybe even a whole week if you really like it. Find a clean coin or pebble. Oh, I missed a section, but we're just going to go ahead here for you. <laughs> and place it on your tongue. And the next time you need to speak, you'll have to move that object and tuck it into your cheek in order to be able to say something. That will be enough time for you to ask yourself, what is it that I want to say right now? And if there's any adjustments that you want to make to how you're going to say it or why you're saying it, you can do that. That's, that time will be there for you. As we gather in community to make change, let's focus on appreciation and possibility. There's some questions that are helpful when we're gathering. Ask, what is it that we want to create together? And what do you enjoy doing that you're willing to share with others for their benefit? And while you're listening, consider listening empathically and listening for the values beneath people's expression. Ask, why is this meaningful for you? And what do you need to support you in sharing what you've identified that you'd like to? This is the way that we can move forward together and build a community that will work for all of us, being responsive to each other's needs. Our thoughts, speech, and the actions that follow from them are the tools that we have to transform our community. And this transformation is linguistic and is happening all around us, all the time, and within us as well. We have the power to either recreate, perpetuate our current situations, or reinvent them to be more in line with our values and ideals. It's up to us. 
I look forward to reinventing with you. Thank you for your kind attention.